What's up guys, Tim Little. Welcome back to Tactical Bass. In today's video, we are talking about spring bass fishing, sight fishing. These fish are going shallow, whether you're bed fishing or you're seeing fish cruising shallow flats. Today's video, we're covering some, uh, some favorite baits, techniques, clothing, glasses, all that good stuff to help you guys get more confidence and catch more fish this spring. Odds are, if you're fishing anywhere in the month of April, uh, unless you're on one of the extreme northern, uh, you know, the Great Lakes or something like that, odds are you're going to be uh, around bedding fish, or at least fish moving shallow uh, for the spawn, the pre-spawn, the actual act of spawning, right? And we know that this is a sensitive top topic. Some some anglers are or are are for sight fishing, bed fishing. Uh, some anglers are against it. Uh, we're not going to take sides on any of that. But odds are, if you're fishing shallow this time of the year, you are fishing in and around uh, spawning fish. Now I say sight fishing, right? You didn't just because you're uh, using polarized sunglasses and you're looking at fish um, or you're casting around docks, you're seeing fish, doesn't necessarily mean that you're truly bed fishing, right? You can actually sight fish without fishing on beds. There's been tons of times where I've pulled up to docks or I've seen fish back under a lay down that I could see and I would skip a bait to them. So uh, this applies to whether you're just sight fishing around uh, shallow cover or you're actually bed fishing, but um, got some, some techniques, some tips, uh, some mistakes that a lot of guys make that I've made in the past. Uh, we're gonna cover all of that to help give you guys more confidence fishing shallow in and around sight fish this spring okay so uh, number one tip and this really this tip really applies to not just fishing but just everyday life uh, and that is getting a good quality pair of polarized sunglasses you know you only are given one set of eyes you only have one set of eyes for your entire life and you need to take care of them so i wear sunglasses uh 365 five days out of the year it doesn't matter if i'm uh fishing or if i'm driving if it's sunny or it's cloudy or it's raining I, even when i'm driving i'm wearing some kind of a brighter lens like an amber lens that really lights up really lights up your environment and it takes away the glare. So it takes away the road glare, whether you're a golfer or a fisherman, you need to protect your eyes, okay? So 365 days a year, I have a pair of sunglasses with me and it is nowhere uh, more important fishing wise as the springtime as you're going shallow, as you're sight fishing, whether it's a bed or you're sight fishing under cover or docks or around cover, you need a good pair of polarized sunglasses. So, you know, through the years, we've used several types of glasses. Um, I think last year or the year before, some of you guys probably know this, that Matt and I launched our tactical line of sunglasses through uh, Ice Surrender. Ice Surrender is a good friend of ours and we had helped him with products in the past. We've worn his products in the past, uh, compared his products to other way more expensive uh, glasses out on the market, and uh, they're great, right? So we spent, I spent a lot of time uh, designing the frames and picking the lens colors, and uh, just we wanted to make the nicest, safest pair of sunglasses, but still be affordable. And, uh, and we did that a couple years ago. We came out with the tactical line of uh, sunglasses. Couldn't be more proud or happy with them. Went with a really thick lens. So it's almost a, a safety lens thickness. So if you're a guy that likes to flip or punch, and we've all seen those, those bad images on the internet, right? Of someone that takes an ounce and a half bullet weight to the face or the eye, right? Having some sa safety glasses, basically, you will save your eye. Uh, more importantly, 
Uh, it's protecting your, your retina, it's protecting your eyeballs, right? Seeing, taking the, the UVA and UVB rays away from your eyes is super important. And I don't wanna go on this whole rabbit hole of why you you know should, should buy our sunglasses or whatever, but I, just buy a good quality pair of sunglasses, okay? Uh, we did, we went with breakaway uh, arm pieces, in case you sit on them, you drop on them, you step on them, they pop right back in. Um, you know, we went with rubber nose pieces. We did everything we could. We went with a hydrophobic and an oleophobic uh, coatings on the lenses for, for smudges and to uh, let water go away so they don't spot. But uh, we designed a really awesome pair of glasses uh, for fairly inexpensive in its category. And I'm gonna be completely honest, guys. Uh, I went out just a couple weeks ago. I was doing some sight fishing. I went in to a, a tackle shop and I bought the most expensive glasses I could that were on the market. They were, they were uh, right around $300. And I took them out and I went side by side with our glasses. And believe it or not, um, I like ours better. So uh, with that said, no matter which brand you decide to go with, if you're going to be fishing this style, if you want to take care of your eyes, get yourself a good pair of sunglasses. Okay. Now with that said, this time of the year, ambers. Amber lenses, in our line, we went with four colors. We went with amber, copper, green, and gray. The gray kind of have a, a mirrored coating. Uh, that doesn't really necessarily apply this time of the year, but uh, putting on the headlights. So these guys right here, those are the ambers, like a yellow lens. Then we went with this guy right here. This is the copper. Now this is a really bad way to show you guys, okay? The copper. It's more like that rose color. And this is the color that I actually wear probably, probably 75% of the time. Um, it's just, it uh, really contrast, shows contrast really well. So when you're looking in the water, if you're on a fishery that has like some kind of algae bloom, uh, you can see a lot better uh, in deeper water with the, the copper lens than you can with the ambers. This is just like putting on headlights, right? Super bright all the time. Uh, sometimes you'll get some reflection with that uh, dingier water or that uh, algae bloom. So that's when I would go with, with that uh, kind of rose color, that copper style lens, but just being comfortable. I love the saturation, the colors that that, that rose lens, that copper lens really shows. So that's why I wear them a lot of the times. You'll see them, you'll see them in a lot of my videos. And then of course the greens, quite a bit darker. Uh, that's in your super bright days. If you're in a clear water situation, like a clear highland reservoir where you have 12 to 15 foot of visibility, the green lens really shows uh, contrast really well. And uh, if you are a sight fisherman, it shows that lateral la line extremely well. So again, we designed these guys uh, a couple years ago. Super proud of them. The reviews have been great and uh, the feedback has been uh, extremely positive so we appreciate those of you guys that have went out and pot, bought those but uh, no matter what brand of sunglasses you wear or are sponsored by or want to get just make sure that you're taking care of your eyes and it will help you this time of the year all right off of that tangent that was the number one tip take care of your eyes get good polarized sunglasses okay number two be treat Treat shallow fishing, it doesn't matter if you're sight fishing or bed fishing or just going shallow to flip a jig. Uh, treat this time of the year, and most times of the year, uh, treat it like you're going hunting or you're trying to be stealthy, right? You, you don't want to be clanking around on your trolling motor. You don't want to be playing music or uh, you know, slamming rod lockers or I've seen all of it, right? Uh, when you go shallow, I like to put my units on standby put all my units on standby. I'll turn my sonar pinging off, right? So you're not hearing that, that tick, 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 tick underwater. You know, a lot of the stuff we've learned by watching underwater footage, it's crazy the amount of stuff that we don't necessarily pay attention to. But when you're underwater or you have a camera underwater with a microphone, the, the stuff that it picks up, sound travels faster underwater than above water, right? So uh, those fish are gonna know you're there before you before you realize that they're there right so you want to do everything in uh, uh, everything in your uh, under your control to be as stealthy as possible now that comes with like i said 
putting your units on standby, turning that sonar pinging off, you know, dropping your trolling motor, turn your big motor off farther away as you move into the shallows, whether it's a, a bed fish you're looking for or a dock line that you want to fish, right? Go in with your trolling motor, go in stealthy. Um, again, cut that music off, quit talking loud, quit slamming rod lockers. Uh, and, and one of the biggest things is, is clothing. You know, I talked about this in this video last year when we were talking this, this time of the year, you know, clothing, right? I see so many guys wearing like bright orange or white or bright red, real bold color clothing as they're sitting there working a bed fish, trying to get that, that fish to eat their bait. Guess what? They can see you, right? You want to do everything in your power to one, come in quietly and be stealthy. So get yourself a good sun shirt, something that you can mask up, right? Mask up, cover up. You're going to blend in with the sky, the cloud cover, right? So don't be wearing your bright whites or your, your reds, your orange, your blaze oranges. I see guys looking like they're going out hunting, right? And they're bed fishing. Uh, you know, that wa that fish can see you better than you can see them basically. So be cognizant of that. Be thinking of that again. You know, if it's a, it's a cloudy day, you can get away with your grays or, or you know, that type of color, but, um, get yourself some, some nice, nice sun gear that will help blend in to your surroundings. Okay. And then last but not least, as far as that, uh, I don't think I talked about this last year. I don't know if I've ever heard anybody talk about it, but don't silhouette yourself. Okay. So if you come into like, say we're in a Creek right here and over here you have, it's flat and you got hundreds of yards of visibility at lake level, right? Nothing until the far shoreline. So it's just lake. And then over here you have shoreline with a tree line. You want to position your boat here so your, your backdrop is, is broken up by the trees versus positioning yourself over here where you're the only person standing right here, right? With that whole background. You're silhouetted. Every movement you make uh, is, is exaggerated. Everything that you do, that fish can see, right? And uh, I know I'm going down some some rabbit holes on this sight fishing thing, but there is some technique to it, right? There's a reason why a lot of guys can catch those, uh, you know, double digit fish, multiple double digit fish in the spring because they're really good at being stealthy, being smart, and uh, and finding those fish. So again, don't silhouette yourself against that horizon, right? So pay attention to that, okay? So check your clothing, be stealthy, and uh, and don't silhouette yourself. Now, last last tip that I wanted to give uh, talks um, about boat positioning. You know, I already talked about motor, right? Come in quietly, come in stealthy. Uh, boat positioning. So if you are fishing a dock line, okay? Let's take this. Let's take the bed fishing out of it. Say you're fishing a dock line. Um, comes around, there's kind of basically two areas of that dock line, so it's in the back of a bay, right? Which side do you want to start on? For me, personal experience, I want the sun basically in or to my face. I want my shadow to be behind me. And the reason I want that is I don't want my shadow hitting that dock line coming across the water and uh, shading out that fish or spooking that fish before I even get a chance to fish for it. Does that make sense? Granted, it kind of sucks that you kind of have the sun in your face or whatever, kind of limits visibility, but it also allows you to keep that shadow, your shadow behind you, okay? Now, if you are rolling up on a bed fish, okay, you got your bed right here, you know, you've came in stealthy, you got the right clothing on, you got your glasses on, you're all covered up, you're ready to go. It's the fish of a lifetime, right? There's a, a three pound male with a 12 pound female, okay? Same thing, boat positioning. You don't, if, if possible, you don't want your shadow to go across that bed before you can get set up and start fishing for that fish, right? Okay, last thing with boat positioning, if that bed is right here and you have deep water over here, don't put your boat 
in between your boat, your kayak, whatever you're fishing out of, don't put that in between the bed and the deep water. You want that fish to feel like it has a clear escape route to deep water. Now we've learned a lot of this, a lot of this stuff is coming from uh, just watching underwater uh, footage, right? seeing how all these fish have different temperaments. They all have like basically different personalities. Some fish are way more aggressive than others. Some are super skittish. Some just get outright pissed. They get mad. Um, but you'll see the dorsal fin stick up, right? You'll see them start flaring their gills a lot more. You can tell they're getting stressed when you block off uh, that access or that you get in between the clear access to that deeper water okay so if you can be cognizant of that if you can think about think about the bow positioning think about where the sun is where your shadow is going to be don't silhouette yourself wear some camouflage right and and be quiet okay those are my tips for sight fishing now as far as technique okay we've all like I said, we've all been fishing in April. You know, you might be smallmouth fishing and you cast over here and from 30 feet away, just start swimming full speed, smallmouth, right? Three pound, four pound smallmouth, just beelines for your bait, your drop shot and eats it. You set the hook, you play it, gets the boat. You realize, oh shoot, that was a bed over there, right? That's not gonna happen every time. You know, smallmouth are crazy, but that's not gonna happen all the time. It's great when it does, you don't even realize that you are fishing in or around a, a spawning fish, but you are, and that fish comes over there. On the flip side, you're looking at that bed. There's that three pound largemouth with that 12 pound female, your PB, the fish of a lifetime. What is the technique or what is the strategy to catch her, not him? And that is technique. It's taken years and years, uh, you know, just learning, you know, us fishing around big fish a lot on the West Coast, uh, there is a science to it. There is a technique to it. Sometimes you, you might sit up on that fish for four hours, right? It's this whole chess game. And I don't want to catch him. I want to catch her. And when and getting back to that underwater footage, you know, I talked about it a little bit ago. These fish, they all have different temperaments. For whatever reason, they just do. And they also have different baits that trigger them that make them more defensive or more aggressive or less aggressive than other baits some some fish absolutely hate a jig some fish absolutely hate a drop shot right it's all um there is a technique to it there is um there is always an area on that bed, talking bed fishing specifically, uh, there's always an area on that bed that those fish are more defensive of than others. There is a spot on spot that you have to figure out. You know, you get set up, you got the wind, you, know, you get the wind all set, you know, right? You got your boat blocking the ripples going in the bed so you can see it eliminates the, the reflection. You have your shadow behind you. You got deep water access in front of you so that fish isn't getting all stressed. You're all set up and now you got to find what is that fish defending, right? What is the true spot on spot? So uh, once you figure that out, then you can rotate through baits and figure out which style of bait or which type of bait, which color of bait uh, those fish uh, react to. Since I said color, I want to emphasize something. And I'm going to talk about baits here shortly, but um, both Matt and I will agree on this. We're not the bright chartreuse. We're not throwing bright white. We're not throwing those super bright colors that we can visibly see. We're throwing natural baits, realistic looking baits, things that uh, it makes it really hard to see. Again, we're staying as far away from that bed as possible we're using our eyes we're we're, we're trying to pick up uh, lateral lines and flashes and all that sort of stuff but um colors for baits we're always going natural it just seems to work better for us yes you can pick up a, a white jig or a chartreuse you know whatever and throw it on the bed and see it from 30 yards away 
uh, and there will be fish that eat it. But if you are one of those guys that's looking for one of those true giants, uh, for the most part, they eat those natural color baits. Okay, so I talked about color. I talked about the spot on spot. Now it's this whole cat and mouse game. Again, maybe you're a tournament guy and that three pounder will help you. You catch that three pounder, but the goal is to catch that big fish, right? Um, I said it, now I'm thinking it, kind of going off on a little bit of tangent. This time of the year, guys, fish care, well, every day of the year, fish care is extremely important. But especially in the springtime, as these fish are coming up, uh, you know, you catch that true fish of a lifetime, your PB, you know, catch it, take a couple pictures and let her go, you know, let her go down there, uh, relax. She just went through a whole stressful process. You probably fought her for a little bit. She's wore out. You know, don't throw her in your live well if, if you, if you can avoid it, right? Let her go. You got your pictures, you got your measurements, you let her go. Now she can finish that spawn or start that spawn and produce those genetics for uh, you know a long time so our kids can catch those big fish. So fish care is extremely uh, important every day of the year, but extremely, extremely important when they're up shallow and they're in and around beds, okay? So, sorry, I was talking about the tournament stuff and putting them in a live well and, and that just kind of re reminded me, if you're just fun fishing and, you're, and you don't need to put those fish in a live well to go weigh them at the tournament weigh in, you know, let them go as soon as possible. I mean, heck, I remember fishing tournaments way back when and catching those bed fish and uh, you know, you gotta throw them in the live well, you gotta weigh them, but then I would actually take them, launch the boat, or you know, just go jump in the boat and then go take them back to the area that I caught them because I uh, didn't wanna stress those fish when they're exerting a ton of energy, okay? I don't know if, I don't mean, how, many, how many tangents I went on today, but uh, I feel like it's been quite a few. So getting back to it, that whole cat and mouse deal, right? You don't wanna catch him, you wanna catch her. She is the PB, okay? Watching hours and hours and hours of underwater footage of this process, you know, it's almost like the big females sit back and they let the males do all the work, right? You might be pitching that jig into that bed and that, that male's just hitting it, hitting it, hitting it, right? You're not setting the hook. You might even have cut the barb off or whatever, right? You don't want that fish to eat that jig, right? You want to get her to move in and start defending that spot. So you keep pitching and flipping and it could be 10 minutes, it could be 20 minutes, it could be two and a half hours, right? And eventually you can start seeing her tail kick, her dorsal fin starts sticking up, her, she starts flaring. You can see, right, with these eyes, you can see that she now is getting frust frustrated. She's getting flustered and she's getting impatient. And I have seen it over and over and over again. She'll start to move in. You flip that jig in there, she starts to move in. That male no longer cares about your jig, but he hits her and he pushes her out of the way. Like, no, don't do this. No, don't do this. I have it, right? And then finally, it's like he gives up. And then she moves in. You flip that jig in there and she smokes it. It's almost like, are you done yet? Can I just take care of this? I need to do this, right? And it's this whole waiting game, this whole process, this technique that I talk about. That's why there's guys that are so good in the springtime catching the big females off of, off of beds. It's that whole cat and mouse game. It's rotating baits. It's finding that spot. It's doing all of this and then playing that game, waiting her out, getting her fired up. And heck, you might have one shot or you might get a handful of shots. I've had it where she comes in, male hits her a couple times, that third or fourth flip, she comes in, she smokes it, and uh, you make sure she has it, and then you set the hook, because you don't want to set early and, uh, and foul her outside the mouth, right? You want to hook her in the mouth, which is another tip. Don't swing on your eyes. Feel the weight, let it load up, and then swing, okay? Um, but she might come in and smoke that jig, and you're late, she spits it, and then one, she either felt it, didn't like it, or two, she spooked herself and she's gone. That's it. Your entire game is over. You've just spent the last half an hour or an hour trying to get that bite right there and it's done. On the flip side, I've had it where 
Same thing, you miss her, you flip back in, shake, shake, she turns around, hammers it. Boom, now you got your 12 pounder, right? It is, it's a mental game. It, there's some strategy to it. So um, all that to say, guys, uh, there is technique. There is things that you can do to put the odds in your favor the next time you come across that fish of a lifetime. Okay, enough on that. Let's talk baits. All right, so baits. Um, basically, basically, I have some kind of jig or creature. I have a drop shot, a Ned rig, and a swim bait. For me, it's that simple, right? And there's so many different versions of those baits. So let's kind of go through those baits uh, real quickly. For the most part, we'll start smallest and we'll go biggest, okay? For the most part, I love throwing an exposed hook. Just like I talked about a little bit ago, when you see that fish come in and uh, you know maybe you don't have perfect clarity or maybe you can't see perfectly, you see that everything looks right, right? She came in and you check your rod and there's no weight. Okay. She, she just, she's blue on it or she just kind of, she just charged it. You flip back in there. Same thing happens. You lift up. It's a little bit heavier. You check and then you reel down. Having that exposed hook a lot of times will hook those fish, uh, hook those fish when they try and spit it out. It catches on the roof of the mouth. It just gives you that extra split second to reel down and set the hook once she has it. Uh, I'm holding this bait. This is the X zone Ned zone. That is an awesome bait. Stands up like that. That little tail's down there dancing and that will drive that male crazy. Again, if you want to catch him, catch him. If you want to catch her, that will get him fired up. Okay. Another tip for you. We talked about natural baits. We don't throw the chartreuses. We don't throw the whites. Uh, we do throw sometimes a chartreuse head. Okay. Just adds a little bit of visibility. The farther out you are, uh, if you're a, a clear water fisherman fishing smallmouth, they hate that chartreuse. And the benefit of throwing a chartreuse head versus a chartreuse tail, it just gives them something to bite. And uh, given the choice, I'd rather have them bite the hook than bite the plastic that doesn't have a hook. Make sense? Okay. So that X zone, again, natural colors. If you need to add some chartreuse, go with adding the head. But having that exposed hook uh, makes all the difference in the world and will give you, will put more fish in the boat um, even if they're trying to spit it out. Okay. So next up is a drop shot for me, two basic types of drop shots, right? You have exposed hook and you have, uh, a weedless or Texas rigged. The biggest thing with the, the, the drop shot, I typically want my leader as short as possible. It only, you know, right now it's about 10 or 12 inches. Typically, if I'm sight fishing or I'm bed fishing, uh, I'm going to have that thing two to four to five inches. I'm going to have it fairly short and I'm going to go with a heavier weight because as I'm shaking, I don't want that bait to come off that spot on spot, right? I want that bait to anchor down and just shake that rod tip so that worm's down there dancing, right? I don't want to move a lot. So I go with a heavier weight typically three eighths, maybe even a half ounce. I will go with a six inch straight tail worm, uh, the missile magic worm by far one of my favorites. Uh, it just has a lot of body to it and you can go with a more stout of a hook, like a, a cover shot HD, a two X hook. You can see I'm throwing that on a bait caster, right? If you're playing with big fish, you got to have big line, big rod, big hook, right? Okay. So that is the Texas rig. On the flip side, say I'm fishing, say I'm fishing um, open water, spotted bass or smallmouth, and a big one, you know, is three to five pounds. That's what I'm going with. Oh, I got one here. We got one here, right here. That's what I'm going with a exposed hook. Okay. Pop this back on. I'm going with more of a bait fish style bait, little shad looking bait, smaller bait. And uh, I'm going with an exposed hook, just like in that Ned rig, those fish, uh, I'm using a lighter, like a mosquito light hook or uh, a, a gammy drop shot hook. BKK makes an awesome hook. Uh, Hayabusa makes a really sharp hook. 
I'll link all that stuff down below in the video description, but I'm using a, a small light wire hook. The reason I say light wire, one, it's easy, easier to penetrate, get that good hook penetration, but two, if you have too heavy of a wire hook on these little tiny drop shot baits, it, it weighs them down and they don't get to sit how they need to sit horizontally in the water. So I like, this is a little uh, Versa Pintail by Duo Realis. This is a cool little drop shot bait, okay? Little subtle action. You guys know how much we love the Smalley Smasher. That's an epic drop shot bait. And then the uh, the Reigns, the Bubbling Shaker. Again, fairly natural colors, right? This is a bluegill color. We all know how bad bass hate bluegill, especially in the spring, in and around their beds. You see them all the time up shallow chasing bluegill all over the place. You know, you'll be fishing, all of a sudden a bass will go by, you know, what the heck happened? You'll follow it back and oh, there's the bed. Bluegill comes in, pew, chases them off 20, 30 feet. It's crazy. So bluegill color, but that bubbling shaker is an awesome worm. And I talked about the six inch, having that fatter, uh, more, more bodied worm really works well on that power shot. Okay, as far as, um, as far as all these baits, I basically have them lined up on my deck and I'm, I'm going through the motion. I'm going through the baits. I'm rotating. I'm trying to, to see with, with my eyes, the gill flare, the dorsal fin, the, the mannerisms of that fish, which ones uh, does he shy away from? Which styles of baits does he kind of get fired up and, and eventually start, start hitting, right? So I'm rotating um, a jig. You got to have a jig. I typically like a half ounce, uh, more of a compact jig, something with, I might trim the trailer down, I might trim the skirt down, trim the weed guard down. I want that smaller profile. I don't want something giant in the bed where they can miss the hooks and get a hold of a uh, bait without the hook, right? So I'm throwing some kind of natural jig, either like a go-to color or like a super matte brown. And then as far as my trailer, I'm going something with a little bit of kick, some, some, some action, whether it be the, this is the, uh, the cleanup craw. Uh, I like this one. It's a two-tone color. It's green pumpkin on the top, but orange on the back. So again, natural color, but when it kicks, it throws a little bit of, of bright color. They actually make it where it has a chartreuse as well, uh, and some fish will react to that. But having a jig, if you could jack them on any of these baits, a jig is probably the best because it's that that combination of that that gaff of a hook that you're not going to bend out and then having that weed guard on there when that fish eats that and you bury that hook having that weed guard on there almost prevents that hook from coming out that jig to come out when that fish tail walks and it seems like all those big fish you catch off of a, a bed or in and around a bed always think that they're that they're just always just airborne right it's like free will they're just all over the place and nothing will get your heart pumping more than than seeing that giant fish fishing for her for two hours finally sticking her and then having her tail walk right by the trolling motor it just uh gives you dreams and nightmares because i've i've lived both um so a jig uh, if i need to i'll go down to some kind of micro jig that's a really cool presentation that's that little missile baits uh, micro jig paired up with a little little tiny net bait tiny pocket chunk i trim the skirt back a little bit but just a real small profile uh again you don't want those big baits down there where they can get that's a ned rig right just a real small profile stout hook you can still throw this on a bait caster and just has a, a nice little profile little crawl pattern um profile with that said, if you can get away with doing this stuff on a bait caster, whether it's a BFS rod and you're fishing for smallmouth, you're still using that exposed hook, light wire, light line. It's just easier to make those flips and pitches with a bait caster, click, flip, click, flip, than it is to grab your line, flip the bail with a spinning rod. If you can get away with doing a bait caster, you'll have more control of those fish once you hook them. So, uh, and then last but not least, some kind of swim bait, okay? Uh, I have a couple down here for you. Uh, let's start with the well, bluegill, right? We talked about it already. Bass just hate bluegill. The Savage Gear, the um, the Ready to Fish, the RTF style bluegill baits. Okay, this is the this is the four inch. This is the three inch. Super realistic. 
uh, just the fish eat them, guys. Like they do not like bluegill in and around their beds. So if you can throw some kind of bluegill profile, some kind of swim bait uh, in and around that bed, it will get those fish fired up. Let me show you this little three inch. Pretty big size difference between the three inch and the four inch. I like the four inch because it's heavier. I can cast it better. I can fish it faster. Uh, but those are the RTF uh, Savage Gear RTF bluegills. Those are awesome. The Mega Bass Dark Sleeper. Again, an awesome bait that you can fish down there. You can leave it in that area. It has a, that paddle tail on there. Again, just mimicking those those fish that come in and like to to mess with the bed. And then last but not least, if you really want to overwhelm that male, throw a bigger bait. Throw something with some kick on it, something that he's going to get fed up and tired of dealing with over and over and over again. Then you can get that big fish to come in and just choke it. That little burrito, the five inch, the six inch is an awesome bait. Um, that works extremely well on the bigger fish. Guys, springtime, April time. No matter what, if you're fishing shallow, you're in and around bed fish. You know, you might be throwing your favorite drop shot out there and you feel the dunk, 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 swing and miss, nothing. Throw back out there, dunk, 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 swing and miss. You know, third or fourth cast, you realize they're just short striking, right? They're eating that worm at the back. That's a bed fish. You know, that happens all the time to me this time of the year. But you're going to be fishing in and around bed fish. Uh, if you are a guy that is trophy chasing, you're looking for those big fish, use those techniques use those baits think about all that stuff we talked about earlier and uh and you guys will have success on that fish of a lifetime guys as always if you have any questions please leave those below in the comments section i will link all these products down below in the video description uh, with all the favorite colors and all that good stuff but uh, as always guys we appreciate the support if you like this video hit the thumbs up button, subscribe to the channel, and we will see you guys on the next video.